The word of God that God has permitted for us today comes from Josh, Joshua chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. The book of Joshua, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Book of Joshua, chapter 3, verses 7, to, 7 through 13, and I will read. Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. This is the word of God. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. It's so good to see everybody here today. I hope that you had a good week and a good lunch and that you're ready to receive God's word. Amen? All right, so based on Joshua chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, I want to share with you this message entitled, A Life of Advancement. Um, the, the sermons that I'm preaching in the morning, and this one as well, uh, I have referred to our Reverend Abraham Park's uh, book of sermons that is out right now. Unfortunately, it's only out in Korean, but hopefully it will be translated into English soon. So, um, as we live our lives, we all need to advance. We all have to have forward progress, right? If we're just stagnant, that's not good, okay? whether it be at school, work, even in the life of faith at church, we need to have daily progress, even just a little bit. And if you look in the Bible, especially in the wilderness journey, for 40 years the Israelites were walking through the wilderness journey. And one of the things that God stressed and emphasized is that they must continue on without stopping their footsteps. They must continue walking towards their goal, no matter what kind of obstacles or hardships may come their way. And there were many obstacles in the wilderness, right? There were many obstacles. Some of them were internal, like unbelief, you know, and grumblings. But some of it was external, right? There were like Amalekites who attacked. They ran out of food or water. All kinds of things like this. One of those external obstacles that they had was bodies of water. Either like a sea or a river that just came in, the, in front of them. Right? So how many bodies of water did they have to cross before they entered Canaan? In the wilderness, how many bodies of water? The answer is four. But one is very minor, so we're just going to talk about three of them. We all know the Red Sea, right? And the last one, we all know the Jordan. And in between, there are two smaller bodies of water that they had to cross. One was the Brook Zered. And uh, uh, even smaller and less significant was something called the Arnon River. So they had to cross four bodies of water before they could enter into Canaan. So I'm not going to talk about this one here. So we'll talk about these three. Okay. 
God always kind of drove them this way to encounter these obstacles. Red Sea is the perfect example for that. They could have gone another way. They didn't have to go down south. If you look at the map, it looks like this, right? So Egypt is here. They left here. They could have gone just this way. There were one, two, three ways of going to Canaan like this. But they came down and crossed the Red Sea and went down to Mount Sinai. This is not the way to go. This is the way to go to Canaan because Canaan's up here. But God brought them down before the Red Sea on purpose, right? To prove his power and might before them, but also to do something else, okay? Whenever they cross these bodies of water, you know what happened? Whenever they cross the bodies of water, people died. It's a tragic thing, but that's what happened in the Bible. Whenever they crossed the waters, or just before they crossed, people died. For example, at the Red Sea, who died? The Egyptians who were following the Israelites died, right? And who were these Egyptians? These were their former masters. Remember, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, right? They came out of the Exodus. And now the Egyptian army was chasing after them. These were their former masters. So what does that mean? These were the people that were telling them to do this or to do that. Spiritually speaking, we were all slaves of sin before we met Christ. Sin was our master. Sin was telling you what to do. Do this and do that before we met Christ. But now, after meeting Jesus Christ, we have been liberated from the bonds of sin. So sin no longer ha- holds sway over us. It's no longer telling us what to do. We are free to do what our Lord requires of us. Right? So when they crossed the Red Sea, the Egyptian soldiers, the Egyptian masters died. So that symbolizes a complete break from Egypt, which is the symbol for the fallen world, right? And crossing the Red Sea, according to Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, Paul says crossing the Red Sea was baptism for the Israelites. Baptism is something that you get when you enter into the church, right? So crossing the Red Sea means now the Israelites are freed from Egypt and they have entered into the covenant community. So their former masters are dead. Now they're part of God's people. They are within the community of faith. So that was the first body of water that they crossed. And then much later, towards the end of the wilderness journey, before they crossed the Jordan, somewhere around here, there's a tiny little brook called the Brook Zered. Before they crossed the Brook Zered, some people died as well. Who died here? All of the first generation people who came out of Egypt. Okay? So let me just remind you of the story. Remember they came out of Egypt. They came up here to a place called Kadesh, which is also known as Rithma. And when they arrived, God said, just go up and take possession of the land. But they said, wait a minute. We want to send some spies to check out the land first. So God said, okay, fine, do that. So they sent 12 spies. For 40 days, they checked out the land. They came back. Ten of them gave a bad report, right? They said, there are giants living there. We look like grasshoppers before them. We cannot go in there. We're going to die. Only two people, right? Joshua and Caleb gave a good report. And because of that, everybody, all of the Israelites, heard the bad report of the ten spies, and they started to complain against Moses and against God. They said, why did you bring us out here so we would die in the wilderness? And when God heard this, he was very angry. So that's when he said, because you spied out the land for four days, I'm going to calculate one day as one year. You're going to be punished for 40 years in the wilderness. And during that time, he said, all the first generation will die in the wilderness. 
None of the first generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, none of them will enter Canaan. So God basically, those 40 years was God waiting for the first generation to die. But apparently they weren't dying fast enough. So God couldn't wait any longer, right? So here, right before they crossed the brook Zered, at a place called Ia Abarim, God came into the camp of the Israelites at night. He went through the camp and put to death all the first generation. That's what the Bible says. And only the second generation, meaning the people that were born either in the wilderness or they came out of Egypt when they were very little, only those second generation were able to cross the brook Zered. So the first generation here are the generation of unbelief and grumblings. They didn't believe in God, and they grumbled against God. All those people died in the wilderness. So this crossing of the brook Zered symbolizes a complete break from our unbelief, as well as the, the remnant of the sinfulness that came from Egypt, from the fallen world. So even after we have come into the church, there's still this kind of unbelief and doubt and grumblings within our hearts, right? That's still there. Spiritually, that is the first generation. And God is asking us to put that to death. Put off that former self and put on the new self. The crossing of the brook Zered symbolizes that. And then after that, finally, they came right here, just before the Jordan. Number 41, Plains of Moab, right? And here is where we pick up. The text that we read today is what's going on here. God told Joshua, have them follow the Ark of the Covenant, the priests that are carrying the Ark, as soon as their feet touch the, the waters of the Jordan, the water will stop and you will walk over on dry ground. But did you guys know that before they crossed the Jordan, people died again? Here at the plains of Moab, the second to the last campsite before they entered into Canaan, the Israelites were lured by the Moabite, right? The Moabite women lured them, invited them to one of their feasts. They ate food that was given to idols, and then the Bible says they committed sexual immorality there. And because of that, God was angry once again, and a plague came and took 24,000 people's lives. Just before they crossed the Jordan. This is that famous teaching of Balaam, right? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 for this. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 says, But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Right? So here... The book of Revelation is going back and talking about something that happened way back in the book of Numbers. Okay? Balaam was a prophet. Balak was the king of Moab. Balak at first wanted Balaam to curse the Israelites, and he offered a lot of money for that, but God would not let them do that, right? So what did Balaam do? Balaam blessed the Israelites in, their, in his prayer. But behind the scenes, what he did was, this verse here is telling us that he taught Balak how to defeat the Israelites by putting these stumbling blocks. Make them sin against God, and they will destroy themselves. That was the teaching of Balaam, right? And so because of that, 24,000 people died here. 
See, this is the most important thing right here, crossing the Jordan and you're into the promised land. These people should not have died here. But they did not, they were unable to overcome this final temptation before entering Canaan. So why did this happen and how can we prevent this from happening in our lives? Okay. In order to have a true life of advancement, we need to overcome these obstacles like the Red Sea, the Brook Zered, the Jordan River. We have obstacles in our lives, right? Whether it's school, work, business, family, church, we all have obstacles that hinder us from getting to our goal. Some we could overcome on our own, but these we cannot. Human beings cannot. Only God could enable us to overcome these obstacles. Accurate description here. An accurate number. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 4, this is what it says. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. 2,000 cubits. Why 2,000 cubits? A cubit, one cubit is about 18 inches. So 2,000 cubit is about 0.56 miles. Or about 915 meters. A little less than one kilometer. Or a little more than half a mile. That's not a, a long distance, right? So why did God say this? Why did he command them to keep this distance of 2,000 cubits? Okay, what does this number teach us? All right. 2,000 cubits is the distance from the middle of the camp to the end of the camp. So this is what I mean. So this is the tabernacle. For example, when the Israelites camped, this is how they camped. This is the tabernacle, right? God's house, the sanctuary, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then they would have three tribes to the east, three tribes to the north, three tribes to the west, and three tribes to the south. They would camp like this. Okay? God gave them specific orders on how to camp, where each tribe would be. Judah was here. It was the firstborn tribe. It was the leader. Okay? So what does 2,000 cubits mean? 2,000 cubit is the distance from the center right here from the tabernacle to the edge of the camp. Okay? So there is a radius of 2,000 cubits right here. The, the entire camp of the Israelites, the furthest distance that you were from the Ark of the Covenant was 2,000 cubits, about half a mile. Okay? That's how big the camp was. Because there are a lot of people, right? Two and a half million people. Why 2,000 cubits? Apparently, in the law, this is the distance that God said that you could travel on a Sabbath day. Remember, on the Sabbath day, you cannot do any work, right? No work. Even traveling is work. So God said, there is a certain amount of distance that you could travel. If you go over 2,000 cubits, you have broken the Sabbath. So God put the camp of the Israelites within that 2,000 cubit distance so that on the Sabbath day, you could come to church to worship, right? To the sanctuary. That, that would not be breaking the Sabbath law. Okay? That's the maximum distance you could travel on the Sabbath day. And if you look in Acts chapter 1, verse 12, this is when Jesus, after he resurrected, when he ascended to heaven... The disciples followed him all the way out to see him go up to heaven, right? And then they came back home. That distance, the Bible says, was a Sabbath day's journey away. Acts chapter 1 verse 12 says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. So when Jesus ascended to heaven, he only... He, 
Remember, he took them out, outside. He led them out from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives, and he ascended to heaven from there. But he did not go more than a Sabbath day journey. In other words, he went only 2,000 cubits before he ascended to heaven. So why is this important for us? Well, I mean, we're not Jews today, right? We, don't, we could drive more than this to come to church. It's not a sin. <laughs> so why do we need to know this? This number symbolizes the boundary of the covenant community. Okay? If you are within this, this distance, you are part of the covenant, covenant community. You are part of God's people. God's people must stay 2,000 cubits from the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? Whether it be camping out or crossing the Jordan, they still had to be 2,000 cubits away. They couldn't be any farther than that. And that's the Sabbath day's journey, right? So what the Bible is trying to teach us is that in order for us to be part of the covenant community, we must always be within this distance of a Sabbath day's journey. On the Sabbath day, where do we go? We come to church, right? The Christian Sabbath is the Lord's day. We cannot be any more than one Sabbath day's journey away from God. If we do, if we go outside of those bounds, then we have left the covenant community. So for example, the 24,000 who committed sexual immorality with the Moabites here at this camp, they, walked, they went outside these bounds, lured by the temptation of the Moabites. And so they died in the plague. So for example, in the Garden of Eden, it was the serpent that tempted Eve, right? Not Adam, it was Eve. Okay? Because spiritually, Adam was the stronger one. Adam received the word of God directly from God. Eve heard the word of God from Adam. Second hand, right? So, if Adam were around, the serpent would not be able to come to Eve and tempt her. So, when the serpent tempted Eve, where was Adam? Where was Adam? The Bible doesn't say exactly, but there are many theories out there. If you look at some ancient Jewish literature, it says, remember when God was walking in the Garden of Eden, it was during the cool breeze of the day. That signifies afternoon, like between 3 and 6 p.m. And usually between 3 and 6 p.m. is the time of prayer for the Jewish people. So some people say maybe Adam was praying. Or it's a time of worship. Adam was worshiping. And Eve should have been there. But she was not there. Right? Look around you. Who's not here right now? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Eve missed out on her worship service. Right? Right? And that's when the serpent came in and tempted her. That's one of the theories that's out there. What, want, what I'm trying to say is this. The 2,000 cubits here that the Bible is talking about, for us spiritually, symbolizes the distance that we have between us and God. That is the boundaries of the covenant community. We need to be within that at all times. So that on the Sabbath day, we are able to come to church no matter what happens. And when we are able to follow the Ark of the Covenant and not fall behind outside that 2,000 cubit boundary, we will be able to experience this amazing miracle of having the waters of the Jordan stopped and be able to cross over on dry ground. So we all know what happened here, right? The priests and the Levites who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as soon as their feet Touched the water, the water just stopped. Okay? So this is the Jordan River. This is the Sea of Galilee. This is the Dead Sea here. They crossed somewhere around here. 
As soon as their feet touched the water, what happened? It says the water stopped a long distance away at a place called Adam. This is in Joshua chapter 3, verse 16. You know, in the Bible, all the names of places and people have meaning, right? Why, of all places, did the water stop here at Adam? This word Adam is the same word as the first man, Adam. It means man or person or humanity. Why did the water stop here? As soon as the the Ark of the Covenant and the the feet of the priest that carried it touched the water, it stopped. The water stopped at Adam. And what this is trying to teach us is that Jesus Christ, who is the true Ark of the Covenant, as soon as he enters into our life, the waters of sin that have been flowing down ever since Adam, all the way down to us, will be stopped. The original sin that's flowing through our body will be stopped when Jesus comes into our life. And not only that, when we receive the word of God and we carry that word as the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant, and when our feet enter into the lives of others whom we want to evangelize to, you can expect the same miracle to happen. Okay, this is what God's promising to us. Amen. And for the Israelites, it opened up the path into the promised land. And for us, when we trust and follow the Ark of the Covenant, it's going to open up many new doors for us. For example, when you come into the New Testament, a different door opened. When the Israelites in the Old Testament followed the Ark of the Covenant, the river Jordan stopped and a dry ground opened up to go into Canaan. In the New Testament, which door opened here? If you look in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, this is when Jesus was baptized at the Jordan. Same place right here. Jesus was baptized here. And as soon as he came up out of the water, what happened? The Bible says the heavens were opened. It was no longer the earth and dry ground that opened up. It was the heavens that opened up. The word open there in Greek is anoigo. Anoigo. It says the heavens were opened. And it's in the it's in a, a infinitive te- uh, construct, which means it's continually open for Jesus. And not only that, if you go on further into the book of Revelation, now when we follow the Ark of the Covenant, what can be opened up for us? That same word, anoigo, is used to teach how Jesus opens up the Bible. Remember in Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, God was sitting on the throne, and in his right hand was a scroll sealed with seven seals. This is God's word, the Bible. And Apostle John wanted to look inside it because he wanted to know the meaning of the contents of the scroll, but there was no one who could open the seals. And then the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, he was victorious. He came, took the scroll from God, and he started to open up the seals, right? In the NASB, it says he broke the the seals, right? But the Greek word is the same, anoigo. He started to open each of these seals. And then finally, in Revelation chapter 10, verse 2, the returning Christ comes, returns, with an open scroll in his hand. In other words, now, in the Old Testament, when the people followed the Ark of the Covenant, when people followed God's command, Canaan opened up for them. When Jesus came, heavens opened. And now for us, the heaven is remaining open because of Christ. But now for us, what he will do is he will open up the word of God for us. So that we could truly understand the inner deep meaning of this word. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, 25, right? He says, until now I have been speaking to you figuratively, right? In figures of speech. But there will come a time when I will be able to tell you openly and plainly about the Father. (laughs) 
Let's all turn to Psalm 119, verse 130. Psalm 119, verse 130. Psalm 119, 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Amen, right? The word unfolding there in Hebrew is peta, which means the opening of your words. When the word of God is opened up for us, it gives light to us, it gives us understanding and wisdom. No matter how simple you are. The word simple here basically means not so smart, right? God is trying to be nice here. But God is saying when the word of God is opened up for them, even the simple will have wisdom and understanding that surpasses whoever in this world. So I pray that for all of us, we may remain within the 2,000 cubit boundary of the covenant community. May we be faithful in, in keeping our Christian Sabbath on the Lord's Day. And may we follow the Ark of the Covenant wherever He leads, the Word of God. Right? And when we do that, heavens will be opened. And the word of God will be opened. We will receive light and understanding. And that will be wisdom for us in the world. Even out in school, business, workplace, wherever we go. That's going to be our power and strength that enables us to live a victorious life. So I pray that all of us will be faithful to follow the word of God wherever he leads us. Amen. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you have given to us. Father God, I pray that you will enable us to be faithful in following your word wherever it leads us, Lord. And I pray that you will enable us to always remain within the covenant community by being faithful to keep your Lord's day. And I pray that you will open not only the heavens, but open up your word for us so that we could truly have deep understanding of God's word in our lives. And may that be our wisdom and strength in all the obstacles or hardships that may come our way. May the wisdom that you give to us through your word teach us how to overcome those things so that we may live a life that is victorious. We thank you so much for your blessings. And now as we are about to give this offering to you, we want to give it to you with all of our hearts and we want to give it with a thankful and a cheerful heart, Lord. God, I pray that you will take this offering and bless it so that it may be used for your glory and for your kingdom. And bless the hands that are giving so that we may have the blessing of riches that do not come with sorrows, Lord. God, I pray that you will listen to all of the prayers that are within the hearts of all your people here today. We do not know what they are, but you have heard them. You know what they need. God, open your heavens for us and provide everything that is needed so that we could truly glorify you. We thank you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God.